Hi everyone, it's Brendan, the Technology Concierge. Today I'm joined by Dougal Mackey. He's currently the Construction Project Manager at Maryvale. Welcome, Dougal. Thanks, Brendan. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, it's a pleasure to have you. I was um, looking back today, it was literally 10 years and three days ago when we first met on a TFE project. And I must say, I've worked with lots of project managers over the years, but you would have to be the most organised and the most professional that I've ever come across. So I wanted to get you on our on the Technology Concierge series to chat about refurbishments in particular. I've seen some really good ones and I've seen some not so good ones as well. So <laughs> forward to our discussion. Well, thank you. And looking forward to and thanks for the invite and appreciate your um, uh, compliments as well. I think hotels are a great challenge and I've been doing them for oh, too long than I'd care to remember <laughs> or count. But all of them, I think that the nature of hotels is that they are unique. Every, every project is unique and every project has its challenges, be they new builds or refurbishments. And I think in some cases, the refurbishments actually are more challenging because there's a lot of other issues you have to deal with, latent <clears throat> conditions and all these sort of things that you don't have to deal with in a new build. So yeah, look forward to the discussion. That's a really good point. Um, so I suppose to, to kick us off, why are hotels renovating? What's the logic behind it? You know, what what generally are they trying to achieve when they when they're planning a renovation? There are plenty of reasons, but really the main one is they need to keep up with the market. They see yep. they see that people are going to their competition. You've got competition coming into the market with a new hotel. And obviously that is probably <coughs> more palette, more, more uh, attractive to, yep. to the guests that are looking online. And let's face it, now these days, you know, looking at a hotel, it might be a review that you might read, but most of the things you'll get, you know, from sites like TripAdvisor. You know, when I, when I travel, I, tra I use TripAdvisor exclusively because they seem to have the best ratings and I haven't with all the travel that I've done I haven't been to a hotel that isn't great that based on TripAdvisor ratings so saying that too though you know people will go and try a new hotel you know especially you know in these sort of post-COVID times yep. is that people are looking to get out trying new things getting out of lockdown and getting into cities that they haven't been to before or cities that have been to before but they want to try a different hotel so I think that but going back to your question, you know, why do hotels renovate? Yep. Because, they, because they have to, things get, things get tired. It's easy to, you know, when you have a new hotel, uh, everything's new and it's beautiful and that it wears, all, all things wear differently over time and you have to renovate. Now, some people, some hotel companies choose to do it in one hit after say every seven years. So rule of thumb for renovations is typically sort of seven to 10 years for a, what they call a soft refurbishment, yep. which is really just replacing the beds, the carpet, uh, reupholstering chairs and sofas and replacing the curtains and what have you, changing the pillows, all of those type of things. Uh, and then a, a full refurbishment typically is about 18 to 20 years where you gut the whole room, including the bathroom, and then start again, and then pretty much start again. And that both of them are challenging because you want to be able to do that work when you are still operating. Yep. Unless you've got very deep pockets and you can afford to close for, you know, two years like the Park Hyatt did, you know. Yeah, and, so. and I think I think it's pretty gutsy for somebody like the Park Hyatt or it's certainly the, the, the owner of the Park Hyatt to be able to do that. But saying that to uh, the logistics within the Park Hyatt, because it's a pretty small hotel, Yep. And because of the way it's designed, it probably, you know, for, for the clients, it probably worked out better. Um, they would have done the numbers for sure. Yep. So uh, it is uh, a lot more challenging. Where you've got uh, high-rise hotels, it's a lot easier because you can block off a couple of floors oh. at a time. Yeah, and have a buffer, uh, floor, you know, a floor below and a floor in between, which hopefully eliminates noise any potential noise yeah correct any schedule work around um obviously you know when guests are most likely to be out so nothing done before sort of nine and nothing done probably after after four but you may have some guests obviously that are in rooms 
on either side of that. But um, yeah, exactly. And I th- I think the you know the nature of operating in a live environment, you know, it, it really requires an enormous amount of planning. And I think that there are certainly a lot of uh, people that do it really well, but there's a lot of people that don't do it really well as well. And it is uh, it is how how the, the whole process is managed. It's a good point. And I could imagine that in software, there's a development, there's a rule of thumb, the, the two by four rule. So whatever you plan, it's going to take, you know, twice as long and cost four times as much or take four times as long and cost twice as much. Does the same rule apply to a refurbishment? It can if it's poorly managed. You know, really, um, when you are looking at a refurbishment uh, process, you're probably looking at about sort of, you would organise that probably about sort of 18 months to two years out before you're actually going to do the work and then planning that whole process of, well, what's the loss of revenue of per floor? How are we going to do this? Do we do it? If it's a multi-storey hotel, do we do it from the top down or do we do it from the bottom up? Um, how many rooms are we going to be able to take out at any one time? How long is it going to take the builder to do those each floor? All of those things. You know, if you're doing a, you know, a 20-year refurbishment, obviously that takes a lot longer than, uh, you know, than the seven, you know, the eight to ten-year refurbishment. Um, so, and there's more, and there's a lot more money involved, and there's a lot more everything involved services what have you so it is a really challenging process and that's why all of those plans for refurbishment have to be done you know start sort of two years out you know in terms of getting a designers on board or however you're going to manage the process yep and just picking up on that you know once it's been planned who is best to project manage it i have seen some hotels that sort of ask the chief engineer to take on that responsibility. But, you know, it's a, it's a mammoth task given the day-to-day. They've now also got a project to run. What would your recommendation be? I think it's a little bit of a false economy. Um, I think that you need to get the experts in to do the work. There's no doubt that the chief engineer has an enormous amount of uh, background knowledge on his, on his or her um, property. Yep. Uh, but certainly. Um, there are uh, project management companies out there and procurement companies out there that do this for a living and you need to rely on the experts. And for the cost of that, the the cost savings that you have employing a professional project management team um, and or procurement company to manage the process is that you get that money back in revenue, you get that money back in revenue in rooms being turned around quicker. Yeah. less issues with builders and again it's it, it not ju- it, it's not just the project management team it's actually the whole the whole team from the from the operator from the client or the owner of the hotel to the project management team to the builder and the designers and the other consultants that you have working on the job as well hmm that is yeah there, there's a lot of moving parts there's um, an enormous amount of moving yeah. parts you can have you know, I've worked on projects where you have, you know, probably th- maybe three people in a team, but I've worked on other projects that have probably 20 people in a team. Yep. They all work quite differently, but also very similar as well. That's interesting. I wanted to have a quick chat about mock-up rooms. I mean, many hotels do them. Some do them for uh, purely aesthetic reasons, and, and, you know, I've been involved in mock-up rooms where later on when we get to the real thing, we find problems. <laughs> and it's like, but didn't we sort this in the mock-up room? It's like, yeah. oh, no, that was just for look and feel. Mm. We didn't actually, you know, work out that you can't open the bathroom door with the main door open. What would your recommendation be if somebody's doing a mock-up room? Take the extra time and actually try and make it as functional as possible. You I've have to, yeah. hotels that will put guests into a mock-up room you know they'll put their regular guests into a mock-up room over a month Mm -hmm. specifically ask those guests for their feedback is that a good thing i think it's a really from my point of view it is a it's a no-brainer 
you have to do a mock-up room at any time uh, on any project on any project and it really doesn't matter how many rooms at the hotel how many rooms at the hotel you have you have to do them because you never ever get a hotel room right ever I've done probably 40 new hotels and about 25 refurbishments and there's always design pieces or little niggly things that you will always miss Yep. Uh, it doesn't matter how many people you have look at the room or how many people you have stay in the room. There's always these little, little niggly pieces. So a prototype room is an absolute must. And what it also does is it captures, if you do it properly, that it captures all of those, you know, the, the problems that you've got and also the cost associated with those as well. So because at the end of the day, a refurbishment can be really expensive if you are not very careful it's a really challenging process and a prototype room is as i said you know you have to you have to do it for a multitude of reasons i think the best ones i've seen we you do have people staying them uh, certainly the stakeholders certainly the owners of the hotel your regular guests and what have you so you have them there you have it there for a little while before you finalize the design you know yeah. before you finalize the design and that might be you know the shower head might be too low or the shower door clashes with the door or, you know, the toilet's not quite in the wrong in, or not in the right position or anything like that. It is a challenging process given there's so many moving parts in a prototype room and, you know, you're not even talking about technology yet. That's exactly right. Yes, these are just purely, should be little things, as in, you're right, the, the shower head being too low for somebody like yourself because you're so tall. And, and then you're right, technology is the other one well you should do that in a in a prototype room as well is my view you should have exactly you know, the television that you plan to go with mm -hmm. connected to the casting solution etc okay. so that you can you know sort out any any potential issues well on truly before it, it really has yeah well. it really it really has to be a fully functional room for you to get the most value out of it in terms of aesthetics that's really the easy part and, mm -hmm. you know, typically if you can afford to do it, depending on um, uh, depending on the type of refurbishment you're doing, you can do one off-site if you wanted to do that. Yep. Or, and the, but then you actually need to do one on-site as well because the on-site conditions are completely different than building in a, you know, off-site in a warehouse or something like that. Very true. Just on the point of aesthetics, I mean, how do you find the right balance between aesthetics and practicality to deliver an ROI? You know, what I mean by that, I suppose, and I think we've discussed it in the past, you know, I sell technology and it surprises me sometimes how we've put forward something that we know that the guests would really appreciate. Let's say it's it's a casting solution, but instead the aesthetics of um, the fluffy pillow, they, they both uh, have got the same cost and aesthetics wins over practicality. Yeah, I think, again, it's difficult and it, it comes down to the operator and the client and the relationship they have between each other. Mm. Um, and I think that uh, always the focus for any hotelier is on the things that guests touch. That's actually where you spend the money. And I think also that it is, it's very easy to have something looking great when it's brand new. Yep. But, the test, but the test of time is the most important. You know, you can have a, a room that looks great when you open it on day one, but after, but after two years, it looks really old and tired. And then, you know, you have the operators screaming, you have the clients, the owners screaming, saying, well, listen, I spent all this money and look at it, it's terror, you know, it's it's worn so badly. Mm. So again, it gets back to the team that you choose mm. um, between the designers, the consultants, and the builder, you know, and the and the and the materials you use. But at the end of the day, the focus is, should always be on the guest and the, what the guest experience is and the things that people touch are the most are the most important and that's where you that's where you should spend the money you know at the end of the day you know people come into a hotel these days now and they expect to have a great bed fantastic yep. fantastic pillows fantastic um, wi-fi and a great shower yep and a dark room dark, and a dark quiet room 
Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, years ago, back when I started building, when I started working in hotels, you know, you didn't care, Wi-Fi didn't even exist. Yeah. And, you know, you, you had to have a good television that had access to free to wear and maybe a few, you know, movie channels or anything like that, a good bed, pillow and a good shower. And, you know, in these days, it was a good work, a workspace within the room. And you'll see, you know, in terms of design, the rooms have become markedly smaller for a number of different reasons. One, the televisions are flat screen and, and also there's no desks in the, very rarely you will go to a hotel where you, there's actually a working desk in the room anymore. So yeah. those le the leisure hotels forcing people to work down in the lobby, which is like, from my point of view, is a, is a much better option rather than having a, having a large room size taking up extra revenue space. You can add another couple of rooms to the floor. That's true. That's true. And with the cost of with land, I suppose it's appropriate to yeah, that's right. To maximise that. That's very true. And it, look, if I think generally people are comfortable working anywhere these days. I mean, I get some of my best work done actually in hotel lobbies, I think. Yeah. Um, so. Well, I think it also, you know, it also just brings... Uh, a different uh, a different sense to the lobby you know you used to, years ago you'd go into a lobby and there's hardly anybody in there and it wasn't sort of very invigorating and yeah. now you can go into a lobby and there's you know there's a lot of people working away or having a chat with coffee or whatever and it's it, it's also a great chat it's also a great challenge and you know and you look at sort of the innovators like ace hotel they yeah. sort of were one of the first ones to bring you know have a lot of vibrancy in their lobby design uh, and bring in um, a stronger food and beverage component into their lobby. Very true. Um, I'm not sure how true the story is, but um, we don't have Citizen M here in Australia yet. There is talk that they will be coming, but in some of their properties in Europe, they actually encouraged fashion designers and people like that to have meetings with, with you know, super good-looking models in their lobbies so that they had fashionable people there and it had a really good vibe, as you said, when, when you when you went through. I was like, oh, this is where all the cool people hang out. Yeah, yeah. And certainly, you know, if you haven't been to an Ace Hotel, that's the type of, you know, that's what they, uh, that's the purpose of their lobbies. You know, you, yeah. want to be, you, want to, you want to be seen there and, it, you know, you want to be one of the cool people. Obviously, over your time, you've seen lots of mistakes. What's probably some of the biggest ones any advice on sort of how to avoid them? I think, you know, the biggest mistakes that I've seen are really uncomfortable beds, showers that you can't fit into, and, you know, bad carpet, bad surfaces that are impossible to clean. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be really expensive. You know, I've seen, I've been fortunate enough to stay in some really lovely hotels, but also some really cheaper hotels as well. And a lot, in some cases, the cheaper hotels actually have been better than the expensive ones. For lots of different reasons but i think that going back to the prototype room piece yeah. is this is where all this gets picked up by a multitude of people you know you have two or three people looking at a prototype room it's not a recipe for disaster but you need to have the full gamut of you know your guests your housekeepers your engineers uh your front office staff everybody staying in that room to make sure that it's absolutely right so you don't make those you know so you don't make the mistakes but again you know using the the right people that have experience in the field of uh hotel refurb you know new build and refurbishment you know everybody has everybody knows the things that have done badly before and you know you pool all of that talent together and you've got a very good team and you've got a you know, a much lower rate of, uh, sorry, a much higher rate of success yep. um, in your in your refurbishment. Yep. So you're right. That that, that mock-up room should exist for a reasonable period of time as, so you can actually get housekeeping to, to, you know, clean it with the standard chemicals that they're using because I've seen lots of, you know, surfaces that have become damaged fairly quickly when, when housekeeping start using you know stock standard chemicals on them yeah. and carpets that I won't mention the name of the hotel but they're you know, very expensive refurbishment and they you know they closed to do it and then um, I think it was literally after three months the hallway carpets looked like they'd been water damaged mm. and it was it was just traffic 
during, yeah. during the three month period that had made them look like they'd been there for a number of years. Mm. And as as I said, Brendan, you know the the, the, the most important piece uh, for a designer and for the owner of the building, you know, is longevity. You know, it mm. has to look as you know the brief to the designers. It has to look as good, you know, after ten years with normal wear and tear. Yeah. As it did when it was, you know, as as it did when it was new, and, and to me that is the hallmark of success. You know, I can think of a number of hotels that I have been into, and I've, you know, said to the chief engineer, "When was the last time you refurbished?" And they told me, and it was twelve years ago. Yeah. Um, and you're right. You know, there are some signs of wear and tear, but generally the room is in really good shape. Yeah, and I think you know, I think it does get back to, you know, the quality of your, your refurbishment. Also, yep. you know, hinges strongly on the quality of your housekeeping team. You know, whether they be outsourced, um, which most which most companies do these days, yep. um, but also the management of the maintenance of the hotels as well. Mm-hmm. You know, from the from the you know the chief engineer uh, and his team. So between the chief engineer and the housekeeping, they are really critical pieces in the maintenance of your property. Most definitely, yeah, a behind-the-scenes team that can make or break the guest stay, really. Yeah, um, yeah, very very much so. Yeah, very much so because, you know, you go to a hotel and, you know, your television is not working or the Wi-Fi is not working or the shower pressure is poor or yep. it takes a long time for the shower to get hot if you're on, you know, if you're on one of the upper levels. All of those type of things, you know, they all form part of that guest experience, which is, you know, which is why we're in, you know, we're in the hospitality business at the end of the day. Exactly. And I think I know I heard someone say that as a guest, we don't truly believe that we're the first person that's ever stayed in this room, but we like to think that. So yeah. we don't want to see traces of a previous guest. No, no, no. And that can be, you know, like a hair in the bath or in, yeah. in, the, in the sink or, you know, somebody's Netflix account. Uh, when you turn the television on. Correct, correct. I'm just laughing because I saw a um, an entry in a duty manager's logbook from a hotel just the other week that um, a guest checked in and found bloodstains in the bath. And it's like, okay. That's a little, <laughs> scary. Sure that's, that's a li- that's a little scary and you don't <laughs> want to... And you don't want to go. You don't want to go there. You know, no. I think working in hotels for a very long time, there's lots of stories that. Uh, lots of people have, and uh, myself included. Yep. And you know, you don't recount those uh, stories to anyone. No, that's that is a very good point. I actually put up a post the other day. It was a funny post, but you are right. There are lots of stories. Um, we see guests at our at our best, and and at the worst. Um, and you know, our job is what what happens in the hotel stays in the hotel. Yeah, exactly. Very much yeah, so. Exactly. So, Dougal. If you had an unlimited budget, given your experience, what would you do if you had your own property and you were going through refurbishment? Brenda, you never have an unlimited budget. <laughs> I've, ne- I've, never, I've never worked for uh, myself or for anyone that has an unlimited budget. True, true. But I, th- I think the things, you know, for me uh, that I expect in a hotel, like I said, is a really comfortable bed. A yep. really a really quiet room and a great and you know and a great shower you know and then you know there's a really comfortable sofa do i like a bigger room yeah i'd love i'd, I'd love a bigger room because i'd like to not lie on the bed and watch television or anything yep. like that or watch a, a video and i think from for me now these days is you know is great furnishings a really comfortable a space that i feel really comfortable in straight away you know, one of the things that I find it really important is good carpet in a room because you you actually take your shoes off and you walk around in bare feet. Yep. And not many people think about the carpet, but and the underlay, it's really important because you spend most of the time in your room in bare feet. Very true. Uh, or, cer- or certainly I do. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important. Like I said, a good shower and great internet and ease of you know, one click to cast on from your device onto a television rather than going through multiple different um, accesses uh, to try and get onto a television. To, to me, that's the most frustrating thing uh, these days when I travel is that I've never seen to date a really simple casting solution for throwing a 
your Netflix uh, on your phone or on your computer up onto the up onto a screen. Interesting. Okay, they it does exist. There are some solutions now that when you connect to the Wi-Fi, mm. they will automatically pair your phone to the TV in the room at the same time, so that when you open Netflix, you have the casting icon and you can just cast yeah. straight away. Uh, and they will note that on the TV that you know yeah. your phone is automatically being paired when you're connected to the Wi-Fi. And that will become more common as well. There's only <clears throat> a couple of vendors that do that now. Yeah, so I'm 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 looking I'm looking forward to that uh, for sure. My life uh, at the moment is uh, is traveling pretty much every week for uh, properties we're doing uh, with Maryvale, both in Melbourne and in, down in Lawn, yeah, uh, on the Victorian coast. Uh, really, ex- and both really exciting projects, but uh, involves a lot of travel and involves uh, hotel time. And we haven't picked up on it, but one of the things that often we still struggle with is providing enough power for guests conveniently located yeah. and sometimes dedicated so i've i've been into properties it may even be a new build and they've put powerpoints beside the bed but then they realize that the the bedside lamp takes one of them and there might be even be another device that takes another yeah. one it's like okay so where's the one for the guest and it, and it may be that you know the guest has got a cpap machine or something and, and they literally need to actually have power beside yeah. the bed they, they can't get away with without it yeah i think it's really challenging and it really you know i think you know if you look at you know at the number of devices people travel with these days if i travel with my two um you know adult children between us so i have two we have two kids uh and my wife and myself i would typically travel with three devices my wife would definitely travel with three devices and my kids at least two yep uh so you know between four of us you know you've got you know 10 12 devices yep and they all need to be charged and of course you know the kids are the most important people they have to charge their stuff first and if there's a uh, you know there's no powerpoints in the room it's a disaster yep and it's a and it's a fight um so <laughs> it's a fight it's a fight till the death um but i think it gets back to the prototype room again true you know and the location of all of the switches and also i think you know these days with the use of having usb chargers beside the bed yep. as well you know that are a bed height and have the dedicated ones for bedside lamps and things what have you down on the floor so guests don't have access to those ones but they're just specifically for you know if hotels are still putting in a you know if you still choose to put in a bedside clock or anything like that, bedside lamp, and then obviously the phone yep. uh, as well. Uh, but then having probably, you know, probably a, a double PowerPoint on each side of the bed and having, you know, at least two plug-in USB uh, charging charging ports uh, on either side of the bed and then at the desk if there is one or somewhere else in the, you know, around the mini bar, wherever else there is a flat surface yep. that, you can char- that you can charge other things. But, you know, you can never put in a, as uh, enough charging points these days. I'd agree, definitely. So I noticed actually, uh, I hadn't noticed up until now, that your background actually happens to be the um, Vive Canberra Airport. It does. And you were in, involved with that project when you were with TFE, and that's a, that's a multi-award winning um, project. Tell us a little bit about that. So it was probably one of my favourite projects that I've done. Uh, because the design, you know, everything was uh, as good as it could be in terms of in terms of design. Yep. Um, the design team were excellent. Uh, Bait Smart were used on the project. <clears throat> Construction control were the builders down in Canberra, uh, and the client was Canberra Airports. And uh, the project director on the project was an architect himself. Okay. Uh, and and between myself as the TFE representative, um, the builder, the project manager for the builder, and also the project director for the client, between the three of us, it was pretty much we were we were given pretty much free reign to run the project, and it ran incredibly smoothly, uh, and opened uh, well. We were finished a month ahead of program, wow, and, and about two weeks ahead of uh, scheduled opening. So it was the first one that has finished, you know, well and truly before what, how we, you know, what we thought. 
you know, there's no difference though. There was a lot of pain and a lot of design issues and a few prototypes. I think we might've done two or three prototype rooms for that yep. hotel, including doing one on site as well. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but again, you know, in terms of design, it's a striking hotel from the outside and a striking hotel from the inside. And that project now I think is seven years old. I think we finished it in, mm. in 2015, November, 2015. Wow. Okay. And I was in there probably a year ago or so and still looking great. It's still looking great. You know, it's still looking really great. So again, it's a testament of time and, and, and a testament to, I guess, our mantra, you know, trying to have a hotel that looking good, you know, in seven or eight years time, you know, as looking as good as it did when it when it opened. Yeah. And that I think that's a great mantra. I mean, definitely. Dougal, as we begin to wrap up, any final pieces of advice with regards to refurbishment? Is there a top three must do's or something like that in your I think I think you have to build a great team, uh, without a doubt. Uh it's a re- you know, it's certainly a recipe for success. Uh, and that includes a project management team or and or procurement team and the collaboration between that team and the operator is vital mm. to a project success the second one is prototype room you know without a doubt uh that has to be you know that is to me is the number one piece and a lot of my role is about time and cost and they are re- they're, they're really critical uh, as well because time is money and you know costs can get out of control uh, without the right management and but also without the right collaboration between the whole team and that includes the build and that includes the builder i think one thing that we haven't sort of really touched on is the quality of the builder there yep. are plenty of builders out there that do varying you know amounts of work but there are hotel specialist builders out there and they are the reason they're specialists is because they are you know they do it all the time yep it's their bre- it's their bread and butter, and hotels are completely different from building an office block or, you know, building a residential, you know, a high end residential house or anything like that. The hotel builders are there because it's what they do. You need to employ builders that know what they're doing, you know, and that and that have a really good track record of doing similar projects. You know, go mm-hmm. and have a look at the work that the builders have done if you're you know if they're on your tender list have a look at what they've done do a lot of pre-qualification it gives you a lot of uh otherwise it will give you a lot of it can give you a lot of heartache and cost and i think you 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 specifically made the point you know about false economies you know choosing the cheapest builder um who has not done a hotel project before may seem like you know a good investment or a you know a good use of your money initially but you're going to pay for it in the not too distant future probably with delays but as you said you know a couple of years down the track you'll find that the hotel is looking extremely tired well before it should yeah it's re- like it is um all of those selection of materials but again it gets back to the whole te- it, get, it gets back to the whole team and it includes as i said the collaboration between the operator and the and the owner of the building the builder and the project management team and the design team, mm. you know, all of that, they've all got to work in. It's like a marriage. Everybody's in bed for, you know, for the period of the project, right from, right from the design inception, right through to when, when you, when you finish the very last room, yep. you know, and you have those and the, and the guests going in there, you know, one of the things that, um, that I've always advocated and I've always done on my projects is that the builders actually are the test dummies in the rooms right. as they as they finish you know you get the builders and their partners and what have you to stay in the room so one the wives or partners say well this is where you know my husband or my partner's been for the last you know mm-hmm. two years or yeah. something like two months or whatever it is yeah and also you know it makes them the contractor whoever it might be you know it might be you know the labourer that's on site that brings his uh, partner, and you know they're all very proud of what they do, and actually, you know, it it actually helps them own the pro- uh, own their project as well, and take pride in what they've done. That's a great suggestion. No, I really, I can, and I can see how 
you, you would be taking taking your wife or your partner along to something that you had a hand in constructing. Yeah. Would really yeah. give you a great sense of pride. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it, it is it is really important. And I think, you know, I, I started this quite a few years ago. And it makes an enormous difference uh, to the team. You do it right at the very start as you hand the first floor over and you can see the increase in productivity and increase in pride and also the increase in teamsmanship, I guess. You know, in te- and it's a te- you know, it's really is a team building exercise for the builder uh, as yeah. well. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, it's not a cost to the business um, or to the operator because you're putting people in there to sort the problems out if there's a block drain or anything. So you don't want that happening, you know, when you've got paying guests in there. Yeah. So they are, you know, they're the test dummies and it and it tests everybody. I love it. I love it. Great suggestion. Dougal, I really appreciate your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Brendan. Thanks again. Thank you.